It was Lamb called Lucky Perk. That's why I watched sports. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I'm down at PBR in the office reruns, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's the last person. What does that mean? It's an old after That's cool. It was cool. It was really cool. Yeah. Like, oh, it's like a pit. It's like a pit. It's like a pit. It's like a pit. Two minutes, two minutes. Thirty seconds, trans ago. All right. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs, et bienvenue. Welcome to the 22nd annual edition of the Teddy Waste Awards. My name is Aaron Woodrick. I'm the federal director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, and I'm very pleased this year to be sharing co-hosting duties with my colleague, our Ontario director, Jasmine Pickle, as well, of course, as always, our friendly mascot, Porky the Waste Hater. <clears throat> The Teddies are named after Ted Wetherill, a former federal bureaucrat who racked up 150000 in food and drink expenses before he was finally fired. While Ted's long gone from government, his legacy lives on through his namesake ceremony, the Teddy Awards, which has become our annual celebration of the best of the worst in government waste. This year we have a total of 18 nominees in the federal, provincial and municipal categories in addition to our most prestigious award, the Lifetime Achievement Award. And we'll start first with the municipal category. The first nominee is the City of Winnipeg for its building inspectors who were caught taking long lunches, shopping trips and completing personal errands while on the job. The only reason this scam was uncovered is because a group of concerned citizens hired a private investigator whose findings were later confirmed by the city. The results led to six inspectors being fired and the other six leaving for undisclosed reasons. I mean, it's one thing to watch a cat video on the job, but extended lunches at Hooters followed by Costco runs is a bit much. Le deuxième nominé est l'Autorité régionale de transport métropolitaine, l'Agence régionale de transport de la Grande Région de Montréal. 
pour avoir oublié d'inclure 200 millions de dollars de taxes dans le budget du prolongement de la ligne bleue. Le projet était déjà entamé lorsque le gouvernement provincial a créé un nouvel organisme chapeautant le projet. Un règlement fiscal différent régissant le nouvel organisme a créé un trou de 200 millions de dollars dans le budget du projet. The second nominee is Montreal's Metropolitan Regional Transport Authority that forgot to account for 200 million dollars in taxes when calculating the cost of a subway extension. It's always embarrassing to get to the till and realize you don't have enough cash after the government adds the tax, but it's another thing to be the government and realize you're actually short 200 million dollars. <clears throat> The third nominee is the City of Toronto Parks and Recreation Department for countless hours spent clamping down on a seniors euchre league in Scarborough. The city claims the seniors were guilty of illegal gambling and after much deliberation, the bureaucrats changed the buy-in from $1.25 to 25 cents. The Canadian Taxpayers Federation obtained 186 pages worth of bureaucratic bureaucrats' work on Euchregate before the Toronto Mayor John Tory told the fund police to back off. The fourth nominee is the City of Victoria, a perpetual offender, for dropping $5,150 on a stainless steel ping pong table in a local park as part of a newly unveiled downtown plaza. The city also announced, announced plans to hand out free table tennis paddles to ball, and balls to nearby schools, businesses, homes and hotels to encourage use of the table, which makes you wonder why they spent $5,000 on a ping pong table if there's no one in the neighborhood who already has some paddles. <clears throat> The fifth nominee is the City of Vancouver TransLink for spending $200,000 to paint red rectangles on the road at five bus stops. The paint jobs, which work out to about $40,000 per bus stop, are part of a new pilot project to deter drivers from parking their cars in those zones. Unless Picasso painted those red rectangles, it's unclear to us why they each cost $40,000. And with that, if I could have the envelope, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the winner for the municipal government category is the City of Toronto for Euchregate. Just when the mayor says he can't find any more efficiencies, we learn there's a bureaucrat whose job it is to pester well-meaning seniors for playing Euchre. Way to go, Toronto. Well earned. Now, let's move on to provincial nominees. Le premier nominé est le ministère de l'Environnement du Québec pour avoir dépensé 4,7 millions de dollars pour créer un logiciel spécialisé et se procurer les tablettes afin de développer un processus d'inspection sans papier. Malheureusement pour eux, leur nouveau processus ne fonctionnait pas et ils ont dû retourner à leur formulaire papier. Suite à cette conclusion embarrassante, le ministère a ôté toute mention de ce programme raté de son site Web. Une porte-parole du ministère a confirmé que les 246 tablettes spécialisées, procurées au coût de 4500 dollars chacune, avaient été retirées et ne seraient probablement jamais utilisées à nouveau. The first nominee is Quebec's Ministry of the Environment for spending 4.7 million dollars to develop specialized software and purchase tablets to develop a paperless inspection process, only to find out that they didn't work and revert back to their reliable paper forms. Following the embarrassing climb down, uh, when pressed, a ministry spokesperson confirmed that the 246 specialized tablets, which cost $4,500 a piece, remain in storage and may never be used again. I don't know why they don't just give them away so kids can play Angry Birds or something. The second nominee is the Ontario, Retail, uh, the Ontario Cannabis Retail Corporation that lost $42 million last year through such fiascos as a botched lottery system for licensing, spending $600,000 developing a new logo. I mean, even the trailer park boys can figure out how to make money selling weed. The third nominee is the Canadian Energy Center, AKA Alberta's Energy War Room. The center is budgeted to spend $30 million to promote the oil and gas sector. It did hire a marketing agency to develop a logo that turned out to be identical to the one being used by an American tech company. The center promptly got a new logo, which is now also being challenged uh, by a different technology company. But on the plus side, uh, at least the logo didn't cost uh, $600,000 like in Ontario. The fourth nominee is Nova Scotia's Yarmouth Ferry, which has already been nominated in this category twice, but just can't seem to secure the big win. 
This money losing ferry cost provincial taxpayers 17.8 million last year, even though it didn't run once. It missed the entire 2019 sailing season due to renovations at the American end of the route. It, it, if it cost nearly $18 million to sit idle, I don't want to know how much it would have cost to run. The fifth nominee is the Yukon Department of Tourism and Culture for spending $139,000 to throw gold in a creek and have social media influencers pan for it. The ingenious Gold Rush 2 initiative called for a local tourism group to crowdfund $100,000 to pay for the campaign, but when it ended up only raising $4,500, which really should have been the, the first red flag, the government stepped in with a cool $139,000 in taxpayer money to fund the rest of the campaign. The organization bought 3.5 ounces of gold with the original $4,500, which it duly tossed into Bonanza Creek, and the government paid $139,000 for three social media influencers and one reporter to document the stunt. The sixth nominee is the government of New Brunswick and the city of St. John for spending $130,000 on an all, expense, all expenses paid trip for Toronto graffiti artists to come to St. John, then return to Toronto to paint the New Brunswick inspired murals. The murals in Toronto included, get this, dancing blueberries and lobsters scratching turntables. And with that, I'd ask for the provincial envelope, please. Thank you, Erin. And the winner is, the Yukon Department of Tourism. <laughs> uh, next time someone wants to throw gold in a creek, maybe the Yukon government will make sure taxpayers' money doesn't go down with it. And now for the federal nominees. The first nominee is independent Ontario Senator Donna Dasko, who spent $15,000 commissioning a survey probing Canadians' views on the Senate. Unfortunately, when asked what words come to mind when they think of the Senate, the number one answer given by Canadians turned out to be ineffective or pointless. The second federal nominee is Environment and Climate Change Canada for giving $12 million in a taxpayer handout to Loblaws to upgrade their refrigerators. Then Environment Minister Catherine McKenna defended the move, suggesting it would be good for the environment to help the company make their fridges more energy efficient. What she didn't explain is why it's necessary to hand over $12 million of taxpayer money to a company which turned a cool $800 million profit the year prior. The third nominee is Global Affairs Canada for spending $11.2 million, which is more than double their budget of $4.6 million over three years, on the Mission Cultural Fund that included flying chefs around the world to cook food at Canadian embassies. Many Canadians will recall the $17,000 spent flying a chef to India to prepare Indian food as part of Prime Minister Trudeau's now infamous 2018 trip. But there are other questionable expenses, including $15,000 for a trip to send an unnamed chef to the Dominican Republic to cook for Canada Day, and another $4,600 to send a chef to Miami to prepare, quote, signature Canadian dishes. I think maybe next time we just send the uh, cheese curds to Miami and they can make the poutine themselves. <laughs> The fourth federal nominee is the Department of Public Works and the Department of National Defense for their botched plan to save taxpayers money by combining 40 separate offices and moving just over 9,400 employees to one single location. The plan was supposed to cost $506 million to buy and renovate the old Nortel buildings in Canada by 2019. In true government style, six separate committees at four different agencies were responsible for overseeing the project. As of today, the project remains incomplete with the tab already at $837 million, a whopping $331 million over budget. The fifth nominee is Parks Canada for erecting a wooden fence on Signal Hill National Historic Site in St. John's, ostensibly to help address traffic safety issues at the popular lookout. Parks Canada put up the fence without any public consultation and it blocked an iconic view overlooking St. John's Harbour. Comedian Rick Mercer called it, quote, stunning in its ugliness, and it was taken down less than 48 hours later after intense public backlash, leaving taxpayers with a bill for $65,000, not including the cost of removal. <clears throat> the sixth and final federal nominee is the Privy Council Office for throwing a Hollywood-style awards night for the federal communications staff that left taxpayers with a $12,000 bill. 
The 2019 Communications Awards of Excellence included a cocktail party with premium hors d'oeuvres and featured a red carpet, velvet ropes, and engraved crystal awards, all on the taxpayer's dime. The event went ahead for a second time this past February, and despite the room being full of professional communicators, not one could articulate any sort of return on investment for taxpayer dollars. And with that, if I could, Jasmine, get the federal envelope, please. Thank you so much. And the winner in the federal category is Global Affairs Canada. Global Affairs Canada for a Mission Cultural Fund, twice the budget. You know it's tough to spend that much money, but I know that our, our good bureaucrats at Global Affairs are up to the task. Thank you. And now, the grand finale, our fourth and final award, this year's Lifetime Achievement Award. This year's winner, is not only the former mayor of a major Canadian city, he also spent a year in prison after being found guilty on eight charges, including fraud, corruption, and breach of trust. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of this year's Lifetime Achievement Award, la gagnante du prix pour l'ouvre d'une vie est l'ex-maire de Montréal, Michael Applebaum, the ex-Montreal mayor, Michael Applebaum. And we have a graphic here. Applebaum a occupé un poste de conseiller municipal pendant 18 ans avant de devenir maire de Montréal en 2012. Sept mois plus tard, en juin 2013, il a été arrêté et accusé. Les documents de la Cour montrent que Applebaum a conspiré avec les employés et conseillers afin d'extorquer des dons politiques illégaux et pas de vin. Il a été très candide avec ses employés, allant jusqu'à affirmer qu'il n'était pas un ange, on doit gagner notre vie, et justifier les contributions illégales en affirmant que les élections coûtent cher. Suite à sa condamnation, la vie de Montréal a été en cours afin de se faire rembourser 268 000 en prime de départ versée à Applebaum, mais la Cour a tranché en faveur d'Applebaum. En plus, Applebaum demeure éligible à sa pension d'élu, signifiant qu'il recorderait plus d'un million de dollars en pension s'il vit jusqu'à l'âge de 90 ans. Applebaum est un candidat particulièrement méritant pour ce prix montrant qu'un politicien reconnu coupable des crimes graves est encore éligible pour recevoir l'argent des contribuables. Il nous rappelle que nous devons avoir les, des lois plus sévères, plus rigides, afin que les politiciens qui brisent la loi ne puissent plus profiter davantage aux frais des contribuables. Michael Applebaum served as a city councillor for 18 years before becoming acting mayor of Montreal in 2012. Just seven months later, in June 2013, he was arrested and indicted. Court documents show that Applebaum conspired with his staff and fellow councillors to extort illegal campaign contributions, bribes, and kickbacks, and was remarkably candid with staff, saying that, quote, I'm not an angel, we got to make a living, and justified the illegal campaign contributions by stating that, quote, elections ain't cheap. <laughs> Following his conviction, the city went to court to try to recover $268,000 in severance payments, but the court ruled Applebaum was entitled to keep it. The city is now appealing that. In addition, Applebaum remains eligible for his government pension plan, and if he lives to age 90, will collect over a million dollars in pension payments. Applebaum is a deserving recipient of this award, serving as a particularly brazen example of a politician who can be convicted of serious crimes and still receive generous taxpayer support, and serves as another infuriating case of why we need stronger laws that strip politicians who break the law of their taxpayer-funded entitlements. This concludes the 2020 Teddy Awards. Merci beaucoup, thank you all for coming, and we're happy to take questions. Uh, I have several questions. Can I ask you, uh, Mr. Woodward, on Applebaum, uh, I'm going by memory, that court decision you referred to, the severance was paid when it was obvious investigators were hanging around. Is that your understanding? In other words, was it inexplicable? that the severance was paid to this man as he went to the courthouse. Yeah, I don't think there was any provision in the law at the time. The law has since been changed. And what was at issue in the court there was whether the law was retroactive. Uh, obviously, it's very difficult to have laws apply retroactively. And I think that's the reason that we stress these laws need, be, need to be put in place now at all levels, precisely because if someone is convicted um, and at the time they are accruing their, their pension, they are still eligible for it. There's no rule that triggers disqualification. I, I, it's important that we do it before it happens. So I think in the case of Applebaum, um, yes, it was true that he was paid it out when he, he had been charged. Obviously, that was the time he left office. The law at the time did not, did, did, was not set up to strip him of it if he was indeed convicted. Do you draw any conclusion from the, the ethos of that municipality, though? In other words, I mean, they could have done a Danny Williams 
you're not getting your severance, so yeah. sue me. But, but they decided that, that there would be a cheese pairing adherence to whatever qualifications yeah. or regulations they had, and then we'll pick it up with litigation later. D d I don't think they read the room. I think they were sending a very good signal when they decided to just hand it over. I mean, sometimes, sometimes uh, you know, maybe by the letter of the law he would have been entitled. But you're right. I don't think the city council should have just handed it out without putting up a fight. I, I want to ask you, it's March. I want to ask you about March Madness. There have been some, uh, two I can think of internal audits that suggest there is uh, unusually heavy transactions on uh, federal acquisition cards leading up to the mm -hmm. last day of March at 11.59 p.m. Do you believe that March Madness is a phenomenon? Yes. And, and if so, how commonplace do you think it is? I do believe it is. I think the evidence is pretty clear that it is. If you break down expenses by month, it's quite clear that it is a phenomenon that's a problem. I think there are ways to address it. We've seen in Ontario, for example, the Ford government has taken steps to uh, try and uh, stop Mar Ma March Madness from happening. Um, it's a simple matter of incentives. You know, department managers know that if they don't use their budget, they're going to lose it. Um, and so you need to find ways to get around that incentive to push money out the door. And I think, uh, especially given the fiscal situation of the federal government, it's something they need to take pretty seriously. So uh, how would you, for instance, federally, I'm unaware of the Ontario yeah. proposals, how would you stop it federally? Yeah. Well, one thing is to, you, you could, for example, uh, rather than rather than uh, tell uh, department managers that, you know, the only way to keep your budget is to spend it all, you could reward them for saving money. You, uh, you know, I think, I think it's a good trade-off. If you were able to reward managers, even financially, for saving money, in, uh, in the grand scheme of things, we'd, you know, Canadian taxpayers would save a lot of money by having managers that are being careful with budgets and not being penalized for their, uh, you know, in a really serious way for their departmental budget. If they receive an uh, incentive personally, as a manager, uh, that, that, may them, that may see them be able to keep a, a tighter rein on the public purse. Uh, the other question I want to ask, I don't want to spring anything on you, but uh, I know you won't begrudge me asking the questions. This, this business that came up in Throne Speech, the party platforms in 2019, about taxing American-based internet companies. This has been around, mm -hmm. this came up in the broadcast review panel chaired by Ms. Yale two weeks ago. You speak to tax attorneys, they say it's a little more complicated than that. For instance, these are some of them are Delaware incorporated companies. They already pay tax in the United States. We do not have a corporate tax treaty with America. Mm -hmm. Their entire business models are predicated on the fact they do not pay state, provincial, or local taxes. Anybody who wants a tax cut doesn't get a piece. Yeah. So uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Is, 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 there, is it rational that Bill Morneau is going to take down Netflix on corporate income tax? Do you have any opinion on the what appears to be a deliberate federal thrust to tax these companies? Yeah, I think we have a very relevant example. We have what France just tried to do. France in attempted to impose a similar tax. They faced serious retaliation from the United States as a result because at the end of the day, that type of approach is targeting American companies. People frame it as, you know, multinationals. It is all American companies that are the target. They're easy targets. You know, there's a bit of tech glass right now. People don't like the big tech giants, but it's a lot easier to say you're going to tax them than it is to do them in a way that's in compliance with international trade rules, as France found out to their chagrin. The other thing I'd point out is in, in most of the cases, who's going to end up paying this tax? In the cases where there has been an attempt to impose an additional digital tax on an entity, it's the consumer who pays. So the idea might be to try and nail, you know, Amazon or Facebook or whoever the big guys are that are making lots of money, but they find it very easy to pass that cost on to consumers. So I would suggest if the government is interested in keeping costs down for consumers, they should be very careful about those kinds of taxes because it is going to be consumers that end up paying it at the end. So are you satisfied there's a distinction between legal non-payment of Canadian tax by these companies and any sort of tax avoidance or what cabinet would like or hope or wish would happen in terms of revenue. Yeah, my understanding now is there's no allegation that they're in violation of any, they're not, they're not, they're not breaking the law. 
Uh, it's that the government has not fashioned the laws in a way that require them to pay any tax. Um, I know some of them have, when it comes to sales tax, for example, they've been cooperative. Um, the, other, the other issue, though, especially when it comes to Netflix, is, uh, is the dicey issue of cultural contributions and whether Canadians should be required to pay a levy on top of their, for example, their Netflix subscription that goes into what essentially amounts to a cultural slush fund. Do you anticipate litigation if Cabinet proceeds with what it t says it wants to do? I think it's going to be a problem. I think it won't work out the way they plan. And I think, you know, whether they see litigation from the private parties, I think that uh, other countries affected, including the United States and the Trump administration, will probably have something to say about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we get some pictures, guys, in front of the... Um